Welcome back to The New Believer as we continue. This is actually session number 17 in our series. And I want to remind you of where we just left off, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because we're looking at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we have been going through the first section, which was the promise and the function. And then we went through part two, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we talked about the fact that the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. But Jesus promised that he would. And so the people were all together in one accord in one place. And the importance of that focus, the number one ingredient to God's movement, is that hunger from inside of the heart of man. Now, we're going to continue after the Holy Spirit came upon them, it fell upon them directly. And we were talking about the two ways that we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. One is falling upon them, but now we're going to the second way, which is by the laying on of hands. So I want us to go back to our book where we left off. Now we are in the third part in this lesson, which is the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. So I want us to turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 14, where it says, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So now we see in this passage, it's very clear they had not yet received the Spirit because the Spirit had not yet fallen on any of them. That's what we were just looking at in the last lesson was that the Holy Spirit falls upon some people. As I testified, it fell upon me in that meeting. But there are many other people that require, or at least it works out that they need someone to lay hands on them to receive. And this is fine because we see that, by the way, the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands of Ananias. Whereas he was touched on the road, that technically was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet because it was later that the scripture says that Ananias laid hands on him. So as we're looking at this, we now see that instead of falling directly on those being baptized in the Spirit, they received God's power through the hands of the disciples who had already been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And this is how we most commonly see the manifestation of the baptism in the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. We extensively covered the concept of laying on of hands in the fourth class on the principles of the doctrine of Christ, you may refer to that class if you need further understanding of this concept. And I just remind you of what we saw there was that the laying on of hands is extremely important. It is not just a religious practice, but it is an actual conduit through which God's glory can flow. And it is risky, I should say, concerning our future for us to eliminate the importance of the laying on of hands, even with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we know here it can fall upon us, but we need the laying on of hands for the baptism of the Holy Spirit often, and also for the impartation of the gifts. Paul's saying that I, I want to go see you so that I might impart a charisma or a spiritual gift, knowing he had to be physically present and he couldn't just do it through the letter. So also I find even when the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs as it falls upon us directly, I would say that by yourself you can do that. Definitely during this class you can do that at any given time you want to. If you place a demand upon the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it will happen to you. And as I said already, I frequently am baptized with the Holy Spirit. Just today in my prayer time before even starting these sessions, the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred again and I trembled and I shook and I wept as the glory of God covered me and filled me. So I see that it's a regular happening in my life and should be a regular happening in your life. At least I pray that it is. So now we see as we continue, we know that these people responded to the laying on of hands with the evidence of speaking in tongues. So the disciples laid hands on them and then they spoke in tongues, which is exactly the response that I have seen many people have when I have laid hands on them and they have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, which is always very exciting. I've been around the world, many different nations, many countries, 
where people had not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and as I laid hands on them, they were baptized and spoke with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It can also happen when he falls on you, as we saw, but in this case, you pray for them. And I love praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's probably my favorite job, and I hate to even call it that, my favorite function or task in the ministry with people is to see them receive the Spirit of the Lord. But I love when I lay hands on them because it's kind of selfish motivation. I get to experience the glory of God going through me. I get to experience it as a channel of God's greatness. And it's always a high that I get out of this. Now I want us to go on to Acts chapter 19. We see verses 1 through 5. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now, what this means is there are disciples, disciples, matitis, learners, learners of the gospel, the truth. They had received Jesus, just like in that former passage that we were just looking at where it says they had not yet received. It said that they had received the word of God, right? but they didn't yet receive the Holy Spirit because he had not fallen on them. So you can receive the word of God. You can, as we see in this passage in Acts 19, you can be a disciple of Jesus. You can know Jesus without yet receiving the Holy Spirit, either because he has not fallen on you or no one has laid hands on you. So here Paul is passing through this region and he finds these disciples who have the doctrine of Christ. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? In other words, they believed in the past in Jesus, but he's asking when, at that time you did believe, was this secondary happening of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, did it take place with you? And they said to him, no, we've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. (laughs) Wow, what, what an opportunity for Paul here. These guys have not even heard about the Holy Spirit. And I could imagine that if I had... I can't help but think that if I had not heard from people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I was simply part of a church group that did not believe in that, how, just like the scripture says that how will they call upon the Lord if they've not heard of him and how will they know if they're not taught by someone so someone has to be a messenger of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this is how the baptism of the Holy Spirit has expanded its influence and has grown in the body of Christ in the last century because people placed a demand on the Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit over a hundred years ago, the Azusa Street Revival, not to mention in history, which by the way, there has been believers with the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues on planet Earth without ceasing since the days of Jesus or after the days of the disciples when they were baptized. It's just small pockets in Syria, Ethiopia, and they have records of praying in tongues all this time, but it became very unpopular, if you would, because Satan did his job and eliminated that influence. But the revival of it took place in the United States and then throughout the world when the individuals like Pastor Seymour and others pressed in. They pressed into this, but these people the whole time were believing in Christ. So now the message of Pentecost, the message of the fact that we can indeed be baptized with the Holy Spirit, gained new strength and popularity over the last hundred plus years on earth today in the body of Christ. And the reason why it had not been common before that is because they had not even they hadn't heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in fact, subsequent encounters with the Holy Spirit, depend upon a message about the Holy Spirit being preached. And just like all things in the matters of faith concerning the Word of God, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, or by the testimonies that are taught to us, the things that are explained to us, we need to hear those truths proclaimed for us to be able to place a demand on it and accept what's taking place. So it's very important. We go back to the scripture now where it says there, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper um, country, came there, since found these disciples and said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not yet heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. In verse three, it continues. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And then they said, well, into John's baptism. 
Paul said. John baptized with the baptism of repentance. In other words, that's a good baptism. He was telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So here, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, but at this point, these people have not yet been baptized in, in, the, in the, and I mean, they were baptized in the name just because they were baptized in the name of the baptism of John, but now they do it in the name of Jesus and this experience. So in the passage, we see clearly here that, and we go back to our book to reference this, they had already believed in Jesus, received salvation through faith in his name, but they were not yet baptized in the Holy Spirit. So the story continues now in Acts chapter um, 19, verse 6, where it says there in the passage, and when Paul had what laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. I really like this passage because it says some things that I enjoy. I'm going to uh, reverse engineer this. It says there were about 12 of them. You know, it's kind of a misdirecting idea that success is in numbers of people in a given group. And I, through the years, I, I don't mind preaching to a large crowd. Uh, the largest crowds I've preached to are, are 5,000, uh, around 5,000. The smallest crowds I've preached to, of course, are empty seats because nobody came to church. So I'll preach to anybody. But I, my favorite groups are smaller groups of about a dozen people. Three years, 25 years now to be precise, and this is the 25th anniversary as I'm, I'm uh, making this presentation, we've been doing the core, and it is always approximately a dozen or so people. And it's usually not that big, it's a small group, just like Jesus had 12 disciples for the three and a half years he was with them. Small groups are amazing. I love small groups. I don't want a big church. I don't want the headaches of a big church. I'd rather continue to train people again and again for the duration of my life in small groups. I will teach large groups and I've done it, but small groups are easier. They're more accessible. There's a greater accountability and I can reach all of them and lay hands on all of them. And so I like that. But here the scripture also said that they were speaking in tongues and prophesying because the baptism of the Holy Spirit will produce that. It will produce tongues, but also will, will produce prophesying. When we're finished with this lesson, we go into the gifts of the Spirit. Amongst the vocal gifts, we're going to see tongues and interpretation and how tongues equals prophecy when it is interpreted. So wherever you see tongues, there will also be prophesying because whenever tongues are spoken, there is a prophetic release or a prophetic flow. And if you're careful to listen for it, you will hear God speak in prophecy. So here I like that this small group of 12, upon receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, when Paul laid his hands upon them, they received it. The result was not just tongues, but also prophesying. It does not give any details about what they were prophesying. Maybe they were prophesying over Paul. Maybe they were prophesying over each other. Whatever the case, prophesying came forth. They began to speak forward, prophemi, speak forward, the oracles of God, speaking of the greatness of God. So that's a powerful happening. So it says in our notes, after hearing that they could also accept the baptism in the Holy Spirit in addition to the salvation they had already received, they responded in agreement and allowed the disciples to lay their hands upon them and they were baptized in the Spirit speaking in tongues. So this account teaches us that salvation and the baptism in the Holy Spirit are two different experiences. You understand what we've been saying here in the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that we get saved after we receive Jesus. The only thing that salvation uh, requires is Romans 10, 9 and 10. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. You believe in your heart and it's counted unto you like Abraham as righteousness. You're seen in right standing with God, not because of your works, but because you believe in your heart. But salvation occurs when you speak, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, when you speak those words and say, Jesus is Lord, you believe Jesus raised, was raised from the dead, but you confess the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and the angels quickly write your name in the Lamb's Book of 
life while they're celebrating. Because as we've seen, once your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are now a client of the master litigator or our lawyer, Jesus, who is defending you in eternity. So now after salvation, we get water baptized. And then we also have this moment of baptism in the Holy Spirit as a separate function. There are some people that will teach, no, actually you receive the Holy Spirit and you have everything you need when you receive Jesus. But then why do these passages say it so clearly? Because it is another event. And so really we as believers today, we know we have salvation, water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit. But you know what's interesting, and I see this in the scriptures too, that there is another, a fourth dimension that was commonly spoken of over the last couple hundred years and even before that, of what was referred to as the sanctification. You can go look this up. It's interesting in history that they spoke about, like we do today, salvation, water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit, but they also spoke of the sanctification which was another level of changing when people became completely irreversibly dedicated to God, an enlightenment of sorts. And I only found out about this because in 1995, I was saved in 84, but in 1995, I entered into what was my sanctification, where I became a different man. There are some believers who receive salvation, baptism in water, and baptism in the Holy Spirit, and have a marginal relationship with God's Spirit for a long period of time. It may be 20 years, 30 years, it might be 40 years before they enter into another level of a sanctification, a complete separation. Not everybody's ready for it instantly. And as I speak this, I know that there are some people watching me right now that now is the day of your sanctification. Now is the day of you coming into a new understanding of God and Spirit beyond the things you've ever experienced before into a new dimension. And we should all long for that sanctification in God, for that power. It's a good thing. So, in conclusion to this section, it is possible to go to heaven without having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as we see in these passages, but it's living without the fullness of God's blessings to your life. It's like having a new automobile and never filling the tank with gas, so you cannot start the engine. The catalyst for the internal combustion engine is the fuel that can be combusted as it mixes with air. So it is with us when we consume the Spirit, the Spirit comes upon us, it ignites us with this fire that burns within. So the baptism in the Spirit is part of God's perfect plan for man. And to neglect accepting this powerful experience from God is to reject His perfection for you. If Jesus did it, how much more should will you say Jesus? Jesus had the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Yes, it just so happened that His happened subsequently after He was baptized in water. But baptism in water was different than the fact that the Spirit came upon Him. And once He came upon Him, it says He was filled with and controlled with the Holy Spirit. And this is what led Him out into the wilderness during the time of temptation and what was an active force continually in His ministry. In other words, He did not really do anything in his ministry that was miraculous. The first miracle is mentioned that he turns water into wine in Cana of Galilee in the very beginning of his three and a half years of public ministry. So what did he do for the 30 years before that? Nothing. He grew in wisdom, it says. He grew in stature. He just developed into a man and he was wise and had great questions and was seen with the knowledge, but he was not operating in the miracle power of God because he was in a physical form. And it required the baptism of the Holy Spirit, even with Jesus. He had to receive the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to operate through him. Because it even says in moments that Jesus were, was in places and the power of the Lord was present to heal. Well, why would it say if Jesus was there that the power of the Lord had to be present also? Wouldn't it just say Jesus was there and therefore he could heal everyone? No, he operated in the power sent from the Father by the Holy Spirit. All of this was as a prototype of, for us, as a template or an example. And if Jesus was baptized in the Holy Spirit, how much more don't we have to be 
baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it's very important. So we see that. Now pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, either by yourself or with your brother or your sister in Christ. If you pray expecting His presence, you will feel it. You will experience it. He will fill you and use you for His glory. So always make it your prayer. And we prayed in our last session, and I'll continue to pray for you in other times. But right now, as we're going through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I want us to continue on. And we're going to go straight into our next section because of our, we're keeping our time here. And so in our books, we see that we continue on here to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, part three, which is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So this is exactly what we're seeing. Part three, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in coming into this section, I want us to go to the passage that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The Word of God says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Holy Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So, there are many churches in which the believers do not accept the gifts of the Holy Spirit as part of God's plan for the body of Christ. And the most effectively evangelistic churches, of course, recognize these gifts and depend upon them for constant help in ministry. And that's where the Holy Spirit works with us, confirming in signs and wonders. And the church or individual believer that does not have these gifts actively flowing is like a carpenter without his tools. It's like trying to build furniture and you don't have saws, you don't have hammer, you don't have um, files, you don't have the things you need to be able to do your craft. We need the tools of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. Actually, it's overall a spiritual enlightenment. A relationship with the Holy Spirit will bring a spiritual enlightenment. And where that passage says that we're reading here, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, in actuality, that word there, gifts, does not appear in the Greek. It was, is literally saying now about spiritual things. There is a place later in this same chapter that it mentions the gifts of the Spirit, which we will concentrate on. But I just want to entertain this idea as we come into 1 Corinthians 12. Well, now about the gifts of the Spirit could have more accurately been translated now about spiritual matters. And it technically says now about spirituals, brothers and sisters. In other words, the spiritual world. As I've often taught upon the spirit world, we are spirit beings. God is a spirit. We are spirits, and inside of this container of our flesh, as we've already studied, our spirit bears witness with His spirit as a spiritual relationship. In fact, it's impossible for us to relate to Him unless we do so in spirit. God's looking for the true worshipers to worship in spirit and truth because God is spirit, and those that worship Him must do so in spirit and in truth. So, we search the Lord from a spiritual capacity. We're learning about a spiritual world, and the Holy Spirit, is the helper, the counselor, concerning the spiritual world. When we relate to the Holy Spirit, as we've just seen the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what follows? We pray in tongues and that's it? No, no. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just for us to have this great experience and for us to feel these things, but for us to become employed and motivated in a spiritual capacity to operate in spiritual realms. So our domain, our sphere of influence is no longer just the physical world, but now we step over into a spiritual capacity. We once were under the prince of the power of the air, but now we're not. Now we've come through the shed blood of Jesus into this new covenant, a new place, and the Holy Spirit is given to us to capacitate us to operate in spiritual dimensions. We are now seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And it's amazing because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for us in the spiritual realm. But in that passage, it goes on to say, however, the Spirit knows, 
And what better knows what is in a man than his spirit, right? And the mind of that man. In that passage, that's where Paul continues to say, so also, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, you have that. You have that capacity when you receive the Holy Spirit. You have the mind of Christ. So we have the mind of Jesus. We have the mind of the Spirit. When we experience this, we no longer operate according to the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of the Spirit, because the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. But now we have spiritual capacity, and the truly spiritual individual comes under the judgment of no one, but is free, it says, to operate in this realm. We are free to operate because we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the outward flow of the Spirit through us, which just starts in the realms of tongues when we speak in, in the Holy Spirit. We can say, When we speak in tongues, it comes out of us. That's just the very beginning of it, not the sum total. And there are some believers that just wrap up all that is the Holy Spirit in tongues. Gosh, you can't do that. It's just, it can't be done. You need to allow all of the spiritual awareness. And that's why Paul is saying here very clearly that he does not want us to be uninformed I don't want you to be ignorant about this, he says. It says in the King James, uninformed, not knowing. We need to know about the spiritualities. We need to know about the spiritual kingdom. And we know that before, when we were pagans or without Christ, somehow or other, we were influenced and led astray by mute idols. And what he's saying is that we were once influenced by a lot of things that are not spiritual at all. And we were once under the power of many things that were not spiritual, but were mute idols or living by principles of this world. But now, being born again, being filled with the Holy Spirit, we have a new world, a new realm. And it starts at salvation when we say the words, because it says there that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So here we see the Holy Spirit in operation from the moment of salvation. It, the, the truth is revealed to us by our Father in heaven. Flesh and blood can't do it, it says. But we know to call out upon the Lord because the Father gives us that. He reveals it to us in our heart. And then we cry out, yes, we believe in you, Jesus. Salvation occurs. And now we're operating in the Holy Spirit as we receive and build a relationship with the Spirit, personal, the person of the Holy Spirit, holding His hand, walking in life. We are no longer ignorant. We don't need to be ignorant. We can be aware, and Paul is telling us, not only can we be aware, but we can also operate in the realm of the Spirit, in the dimension of the Holy Spirit. And so in this lesson, we discuss the gifts that are mentioned in an attempt to cultivate their use in our churches and in our personal ministries on a daily, day-to-day -day basis. And these are the gifts of the Spirit. We see here in our outline, Galatians chapter 12, and it continues. I want us to read now together from verses 4 to verse 11. First, we're going to read the passage, and then we're going to go back and dissect it. But the Bible says here, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Now, here before we go on to the list of the gifts, I want us to consider these first verses here where we see that these verses, verses 4 through 6 as we just read, show us three divisions of the work of the Spirit. We have the gifts, we have the administrations, we have the operations. So this chapter is speaking to us about first the gifts, and that's what we will later see in verse 7 and onward, or sorry, verse, uh, uh, yeah, verse 8, where it goes on to talk about the individual gifts, which we'll get to in a minute. But this is talking about those powers that we have. That's the first division. The second division we see outlined here, right after Paul says, I, want, I don't want you to be ignorant about this dimension. He breaks down the three dimensions of the spiritual manifestation 
in our life and our activity and the, and the gifts are mentioned, but also the administrations. And that's Ephesians uh, 4.11. We know uh, what, what that says, that uh, that's, uh, he gave gifts unto men, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, very important and powerful things that we experience in these offices that we're called to. And then finally, the operations. That's Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And that was the choosing of the people who were deacons. In other words, in that passage, it says that there was a contention in the churches about the distribution of food to the widows concerning the Jewish widows and the Hellenistic or the Greek widows. So uh, there was favoritism taking place, and it does happen. Even in the first church, it happened, and it still does to this day, of course. It's not good, but that's an issue that has to be sorted out that requires time in a physical world to do all that and take care of those physical logistics. And it was cheating the disciples of Christ out of their quality time with the Word of God in prayer. And so what did they do? They chose seven men and prayed over them so that they could take care of that, so they could dedicate themselves to the Word of God in prayer. So we see, as in the beginning of this concerning spirituality, and all this is related to the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our life and the Holy Spirit, is that the, the kingdom of God manifested in an earthly dimension can be divided up into these three categories, the gifts, the administrations, fivefold ministry, and the deacons. So really, you have elders, you have deacons, and then firstly, you have the gifts. Now, all of us can operate in the gifts, but that's broken up. And some people say, well, really, I don't understand what the difference is. What's well, simple? Fivefold ministry are those that speak forth the oracles of God. Think of it that way. Fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, they are the ones that speak the words of God. We have to dedicate ourselves to the word of God and prayer, they said, to the actual speaking from God's Spirit and power, speaking forth the truth of God's Word. That was their function. And when they had the issue with the widows, they couldn't do that as well. Why? Because this is a serious issue. And there are serious issues in the body of Christ and in our social amalgam of people that have to be taken care of. It's my least favorite part of the ministry because I am not that. I am fivefold ministry. My ministry technically is apostolic. I'll get into that later in later lessons. But a pastor speaks. Think about apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. If you have, if you have a, a prophet that does not speak, <laughs> that's absolutely worthless. You have an evangelist. Imagine a silent evangelist just stands there. Looks pretty. I mean, some of them are pretty. But it, it, they need to speak. Same thing with the pastor. Imagine a pastor that never says anything. Of course not. Imagine a teacher that never says anything. Of course it's all about the words that they're speaking. And that is the division of the five. Now, those that were elected, the seven in the sixth chapter of Acts, to help them, they were not necessarily speaking the words in a public format in the church house from a pulpit, but they were supporting and undergirding the fivefold ministry so that they could be free to do what they did. And that is those that help those that speak. And that is the divisions that I've always understood with great clarity, is that the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, those are the ones that speak the word of God, and the deacons, diakonos, which uh, to come from a root that's extinct now, deac, or to serve, to wait at table, to minister, they come and support the structure, the infrastructure that supports the people who do the fivefold ministry, which is speaking. And usually the fivefold ministry is what we call full time. Full-time minister is someone that dedicates his entire life to only doing that. That's me. That's my life. That's all I've done. For 35 years now, I have dedicated myself and my life to full-time ministry under the power of the Holy Spirit, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, walking in the spiritual dimension, speaking forth the oracles of God, just like I'm doing now in the core. Now, I would not be able to do what I'm doing right now if it weren't for people in our group doing physical work. You've already contacted people in an administration of the core and at our church and what we do. 
people in, and I have had so many people through the years that I'm so grateful for that were operating in that realm so that I can speak. They support and help and do the logistics. So we are a group or a team. Now, all of us benefit from that first mentioned grouping of gifts, like it says. So the gifts, the administrations, the operations, which by the way, concerning the deacons or the operations, the physical work that supports the work of the preaching and prayer ministry, those people were required to be full of the Holy Spirit too. It even says it there. They must be full of the Holy Spirit and power of God. And that's exactly what amongst them was Stephen who was later martyred. And so those were great men of God, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the power of God, who operating in the Holy Spirit, used the anointing to do the physical ministry. And now one thing I have found out that it's not a good idea for you to take someone in the realm of the physical support ministry and put them behind a pulpit. Because if they are not equipped by the Spirit specifically for that office, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, it just doesn't work. I mean, they may have good things to say, but I think we've all had those moments in our churches where our pastor is speaking and it's great. And then that one Wednesday night meeting or wherever, some other brother in the church preaches. And as soon as they start speaking, I'm not being critical, but as soon as they start speaking, you get that feeling like, Okay, and you're polite, you listen, but it just doesn't resonate the same. Why? Because that person is not really equipped to do that. We're all equipped to preach. We must have the ministry of reconciliation and teach, but I'm telling you, there are people who are empowered to speak in the church house, and when they do so, you know it. There's a big difference between them and the others. And this by itself is a way that you can discern who is who. The one that is anointed of God, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, to speak full-time in the church house, you will know it from the moment they open their mouth. They speak as those having authority, and you feel that authority. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has designated them. Jesus himself, when he ascended, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Jesus gave these gifts. It says he gave some to be apostles, he gave some to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. As they started to do the work by the endowment of the Holy Spirit, they needed help, and these other people came along. And all this is part of the gifts of the Spirit. But categorically, these manifestations of the Spirit that it speaks of, in that passage that we're looking at there, it says the different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, what does it say? The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. That means that there will be a manifest power of God to support and to confirm the steps that we take in ministry and what we do. And you say, well, well, how do I know what I am? How do I know what I do? Well, that's part of what this course will do over these 200 hours that we spend together. You will hear teachings about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. You will hear teachings about the diakonos or the deacons. And in the Greek, it's presbuteros, or diakonos. You have the elders, those that speak, and then you have the deacons who support that. And you say, what about these other terms, the bishop and the, the this, the that, pastor? Uh, we'll get into that later, but you're going to find the term pastor is very uncommon in the Bible. We use it all the time to describe what technically are elders. Peter called himself an elder and a, to, speaking to his fellow elders, meaning those that are in a position of fivefold ministry. That's the presbuteros, where we get the word presbytery. But now the diaconos are the deacons who come in to do that physical help to support them. But we all have a manifestation of the Spirit, as it says, to, to help us meet the needs of the people, the common good, for the common good. Now, as we continue in this, it starts the breakdown of the actual gifts. And so I want us to see now in verse, uh, let's go to um, verse 7 there, where it says, the scripture, 
Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for common good, and we know that the gifts of the Spirit are for those who know Jesus as their Savior and are filled with the Holy Ghost. Different people have different abilities that supernaturally manifest through them. This is always according to the will of God. So now we go to verses 8 through 11 in this passage as we continue, 1 Corinthians 12. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. The King James says the, the word of wisdom, and we'll get back to that. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. Notice the repeat of Spirit, Spirit, Spirit here. Because as we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and our relationship and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, all of this, to the one there is given through the Spirit, a message of wisdom, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is responsible for the message of wisdom, the message of knowledge, and also faith and gifts of healings by that same Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, known as the discerning of spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that we have received, now that we've been baptized, that Spirit is the one that does what? Distributes them, the gifts, to each one just as He determines. So here we know that it is the Holy Spirit that, dis that will give to us, to each one in the group. You have the Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we thank God for it, we have the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now the Holy Spirit is in a relationship with us in a given group, and he begins to distribute. The Holy Spirit has the ultimate distribution right on planet Earth over the gifts, the allocation of specific gifts to each and every individual. The will of the Father, the Word of Jesus, is the ultimate authority in this relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. On Earth today, we have the Holy Spirit. He is the distributor. God is the one that makes the choices in heaven about you and about the endowments of His Spirit, what gifts you need. He has a plan, right? I believe that there is a plan that was written before the foundation of the world, that He already prepared it, and that He has a book, He has a blueprint, He has an architectural guide, that He has put together this plan, this perfect plan and strategy for you before time even began. He had that figured out, and according to that plan, He has certain tools or abilities that will be very uniquely given to you because like there's apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and deacons, and these people in all these different realms, there also are plumbers and electricians and brain surgeons and chemists, are there not? There are these individuals in their places, all of them require different gifts. I would sure hope that my brain surgeon is not using the gifts of a plumber when working on my brain. I would sure hope that my cardiovascular surgeon is not using the gifts of an electrician on me when he's operating. Also, how futile would it be for the carpenter to be given the tools of a brain surgeon? In other words, each set of tools is specific. That analogy holds true in the church. I don't want, you don't need an evangelist to have the gifts of the pastor. And you don't need the pastor to have the gifts of the evangelist. Those are the tools. They don't need that because their skill has a certain set of tools that go with it. Their skill set corresponds to the set of tools that they're given or the gifts of the Spirit for them. And herein lies the need for a diversity. 
Now you might be a jack of all trades and have a tool shed with tools for many different jobs. Maybe you have everything you need to do proper plumbing. Maybe you have everything you need to do proper electrical work. Maybe you have everything that you need to do all kinds of things. Maybe even brain surgeon. Maybe you're a lawyer and you have everything you need and all the books of the law there are prepared and a desk where you can prepare contracts, do those things. You have the tools for that. That's great. But most people are specialists. And so it is in the body of Christ. There are specialists in each of these areas. And that's where these gifts are distributed to each one, just as who determines? Well, the Holy Spirit. It says there in verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He, as the distributor, distributes them to each one of us, you and me, in our given positions and our functions, just as He determines. He's making the determination. Now, this is where we must understand that we cannot just willy-nilly run out and ask for any gift we want and He'll give it to us. Be specific. Don't go coveting gifts that you can't use. I do not have a surgical operating room inside of my house. I, I do not have a rocket engine that I'm working on in my bedroom because that is not my field. I do not have a chemical laboratory to be able to do things in my home because I am not a chemist and I don't have any desire to do that. You know what I have? My skill set. I'm standing in a studio filled with my tools. I have a keyboard. I have guitars of different kinds. I have instruments here. I have my Bibles. I have my notes. I have even this, this camera and these lights and this to be able to do my job. It's my tools. But I also, more importantly, Given our topic, I have the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be able to do this. Not everybody can do what I'm doing right now. I promise you. They can try. They can get up. We can mimic someone else. I can go through the motions of a carpenter. I can go through the motions of a plumber and pretend I'm doing it. But it does not mean that I will do a good job. I may be able to get it done. And all of you, I think, have used a screwdriver as a hammer. <laughs> it works, I guess. You know, you take the back of the, 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 you bang on it. You know, how many of you ever used a rock for a hammer or something? But how much more wonderful it is when you have the right hammer. I love a big, heavy east wing hammer. I could drive a ten penny nail with two strikes with the proper hammer. And then you might not know because I did work in carpentry. I did work in roofing and construction. Ten penny nail is a big, thick nail. I would put it in place. I could tap once, pop, to set it, and then had such precision that I could swing, bam, and drive that big nail all the way down in. When I did roofing, I would, I could do tacking, and tack, 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 with that hammer because its weight was perfect. It was a tool that I needed to do that job. So it is when I'm teaching like this. I need gifts of the Spirit to do this. You need gifts of the Spirit to do what you do. And we need to really know, what if I had something that I wanted and I was very good friends with the distributor of those things? What if your friend has a hardware store and you know you can get anything you need because he's your friend? What if your best friend, the one you hang out with all the time, had a hardware store? The tools you need, he's got. Your best friend, the Holy Spirit, has everything that you need. And you are a toolbox. And He will begin to put in that toolbox the things that you need. Pray and seek that. This is what we're seeing so far here as we're looking at the gifts. We're laying a foundation for this and it's going to go on quite some time that we talk about this because it's such an important subject. But we know that the gifts, the administrations, the operations are there, but it is the Holy Spirit, as it says. All these are at work, are the work of the one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. What a wonderful thing. I just, I'm so happy with the Lord. I just want to pray. Father, thank You for sending the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit that is here with us right now, <laughs> I am so grateful to You. <laughs> for being the distributor. Oh God, my hands are open. Give me the tools that I need to do my job. <laughs> oh, I feel your presence, Holy Spirit. There are people watching this right now. They need tools. They're trying to get jobs done. 
and they don't have them. So as we're beginning in this discussion about the gifts of the Spirit, Lord God, Spirit of the living God, Holy Spirit, great distributor of these endowments, give to each one what they need according to as you determine it, we don't want things that we are not supposed to have. We don't want things that we're not going to use. I don't want to squander the gifts. I want the gifts that I need, and I want the people watching me to have the gifts that they need to do the specific tasks that they've been called to do. Lord God, equip us and use us according to that purpose. That We beg you for this, Lord. We beg you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to take a break here and we will continue in the next.